My name is Michael Gerard. I'm on the faculty here. I teach environmental law, energy law, and climate change law, and direct the Center for Climate Change Law, which together with the Earth Institute of Columbia University is co-sponsoring uh, this program this evening. The Center for Climate Change Law develops legal techniques to fight climate change and educates people in their use, and we have a large publications program. If you're interested in learning more about us or in being added to our mailing list or seeing our various environmental and climate law databases, you can go to our website, www.columbiaclimatelaw.com. Uh, thank you very much for coming to our panel the discussion this evening about the fate of the federal flood insurance program. Let me first say a word about the uh, format that we're going to be using. Um, I'll, I'll give some uh, introductory remarks, an overview of the flood insurance program. Then I will introduce each speaker uh, before they uh, speak. Each will talk for about 15 minutes. Uh, after all the speakers are done, we'll open it up for uh, Q&A, and I would ask you to please hold your questions until we get to that point. We will adjourn uh, no later than 9 o'clock. Uh, let me also mention that this program uh, is uh, being uh, videotaped and it's also being live stream on, streamed on the web, and we'll post the video um, on our website. Uh, it should go without saying, but I'll say so anyway, that now would be the appropriate time to silence your cell phones. Um, the members of our panel will present, present differing uh, positions on this complex and uh, technical and somewhat obscure federal program, uh, but one that has become very heated in the political sphere. Uh, the National Flood Insurance Program was established by Congress in 1968 and has subsequently been modified and broadened by legislation um, in uh, 1973, 1994, 2004, and most recently 2012. The Federal Emergency Management Agency, FEMA, in the Department of Homeland Security administers the federal, the National Flood Insurance Program. The program was established to mitigate future flood losses and reduce future fl uh, flood disaster relief costs by establishing a partnership among the federal government, local communities, and insurance companies. Communities would reduce future risks by adopting certain kinds of building and zoning ordinances applicable to flood-prone properties in special flood hazard areas. And in exchange, the federal government would provide uh, property owners in those communities with access to affordable, federally-backed flood insurance protection. Property owners in communities that elect not to participate are not eligible for federal flood insurance. Special flood hazard areas are high-risk areas defined as any land use that would be inundated by a flood having a 1 percent chance of occurring in a given year. Uh, this is also referred to as the base flood or somewhat misleadingly the 100-year flood zone. In reality, the so-called 100-year flood zone actually has a 26 percent chance of flooding sometime in a 30-year period, which is a common length for mortgages a 43% chance in 60 years, and a 63% chance of flooding in a 100-year uh, period, which, is, uh, which mathematically are all greater odds than a fire or other potential disasters. The flood boundaries uh, also do not account, uh, at least yet, for rising sea levels, which over time will result in higher flood probabilities. Within special flood hazard areas, certain residential and business owners are required to purchase flood insurance, for instance, if they have a mortgage on their property from a federally registered lender. Although flood insurance policies are underwritten and serviced by private insurance companies, premiums and coverage are set by the federal government and are identical for similar classes of properties, and the risk is held by the government. All of this sounds like a logical way to encourage safe development and discourage development that is likely to be damaged or destroyed by floods. However, certain compromises were intentionally baked into the law that make the system fiscally unsound. Specifically, two types of properties pay below market flood insurance premiums and thus do not reflect the true risk that those properties are subject to. 
Two terms that you'll hear uh, tonight are subsidized and grandfathered properties. Subsidized properties are those that were built before a flood insurance rate map, a firm, uh, was in place for that location. Generally in the 1970s uh, or 80s, subsidized properties are also sometimes referred to as pre-firm. In other words, these properties were built before the actual flood risk was officially known to the owners. According to FEMA, uh, approximately 20% of insured properties are subsidized, uh, while the great majority, about 4.48 million of the 5.6 million properties, pay full risk-based rates. The other category of properties not paying uh, full rates are grandfathered properties, which means that they were built in compliance with an existing flood map at the time, but those maps have since been revised, putting those properties in a higher risk area. Grandfathering allows those owners who had initially built to code to pay premiums according to the original map, not the current map. Thus, although technically not subsidized, these owners' rates do not reflect their risk. Uh, the reduced premiums in both the pre-firm subsidized properties and the grandfathered properties reflect a policy decision that it would not be fair uh, to the owners of these properties to pay full rates since they were developed in accordance with the applicable uh, requirements at the time that they were built. At the time, it was thought that the number of subsidized structures would decrease over the years and new structures would be built in more protective standards. But many of these older structures still exist today and remain a financial drain on the system. While the subsidized and grandfathered properties put the program at a persistent financial disadvantage, claims from several large storms have forced the program to borrow money from the Treasury. And recent storms like Katrina and Sandy which were the two coastal storms in the uh, the two costliest storms in the program's history, have really put the flood insurance program underwater, so to speak. According to FEMA, the program remains $24 billion in debt today. The scientific consensus is that storms and flooding will worsen, while cities and residents further embrace coastal development. These two converging factors do not bode well for the fiscal stability of the federal flood insurance program. Last year, Congress finally reformed the flood insurance program in a bipartisan bill passed by an overwhelming majority. The reform law is known as the Biggert Waters Flood Insurance Reform Act of 2012 and is named for its principal sponsors, former Re uh, Republican Representative Judy Biggert of Illinois and Democratic Representative Maxine Waters of California. The good feelings that, uh, from that rare act of bipartisan government reform did not last long, and that's why we are all here this evening. The law did many things that remain uncontroversial, like reauthorizing and funding the flood insurance program for five years, requiring better flood mapping, and requiring FEMA to undertake various studies, including an affordability study. However, Biggert Waters also required that subsidized and grandfathered prop premiums be phased out and that property owners begin to pay the true risk-based premium for their flood insurance. According to FEMA, the properties most affected by Biggert Waters will be businesses, properties of one to four residences, that have experienced severe repetitive flood loss and properties that have incurred flood damage where claims exceeded the property's value. Premiums can also rise if the property is remapped. Uh, some rates will, decrease all at one, will increase all at once and others will rise by 25% annually until full risk rates are reached. Subsidies would immediately end for all new or lapsed policies and when properties are sold. While 20% of policies are subsidized and, and subject to increases, FEMA says that only 5% will have immediate increases rather than phased increases. As our speakers will discuss, as the premium increases have started to be phased in or are imminent, Many property owners have forcefully complained about unaffordable premiums, uh, declining property values, and lack of warning and information from FEMA. For instance, in a in recent testimony to a House subcommittee, the National Association of Realtors and the National Association of Home Builders, both of which largely supported Biggert Waters last year, 
said that FEMA's implementation of the reforms has been poor and has resulted in severe unintended consequences. Both groups cite examples of dramatic rate increases. Similarly, New York City commissioned the RAND Corporation to do a study on flood insurance post-Hurricane Sandy, which looked at potential premium increases in various types of of buildings throughout the city due to bigger waters and updated flood maps. The study found that certain types of structures were very vulnerable to significant increases, possibly forcing people from their houses. The premium increases have resulted in at least one lawsuit. The Mississippi Insurance Company filed suit in federal court in September, alleging that FEMA's failure to complete various studies on affordability before raising premiums is arbitrary and capricious and should be declared illegal and enjoined. Mississippi's suit was supported by AMICI, the South Carolina Department of Insurance, the Louisiana Department of Insurance, the states of Florida, Alabama, and Massachusetts, and the Mississippi Windstorm Underwriting Association. FEMA has since moved to dismiss the suit. As a result of this clamor over premium increases, legislation has been introduced in both the House and the Senate seeking to roll back and delay the reforms enacted in Bigger Waters. As the cliché says, politics makes strange bedfellows, and flood insurance is no exception. The current debate links environmental groups in favor of risk-based premiums to protect coastal habitats with libertarian and fiscal watchdog groups, not to mention the Republican leadership, seeking to eliminate wasteful subsidies. Many Republicans generally thought to be in favor of reducing federal spending find themselves reaching out across the aisle to roll back reforms and preserve government subsidies. Speaking of Democrats, sponsors of the House bill to delay Biggert Waters include Representative Waters herself, the namesake of Biggert Waters, who said at a press release announcing a new bill that FEMA's poor implementation, inaccurate mapping, and incomplete data has led to unreasonable and unimaginable increases in premiums. While politicians and editorial boards across the country echo the need to put the brakes on premium rises uh, to keep low- and moderate-income people in their homes and to prevent further damaging the real estate market and local economies, others portray the effort as the wealthy seeking to maintain their Hamptons vacation homes at taxpayer expense. For instance, the Wall Street Journal this week blasted the proposed uh, amendments, which it called caterwauling from the 1% and their elected representatives in order to protect affluent beachcombers accustomed to artificially cheap insurance. I hope I've set the stage for the discussion that follows and put the flood insurance debate in context. In putting together this panel, we tried to incorporate a range of views on the topic from different political and philosophical backgrounds. Our first speaker will be Joshua Sachs of the National Wildlife Federation, who will speak in favor of flood insurance reforms from an environmental perspective. Mr. Sachs will be followed by Steve Ellis of Taxpayers for Common Sense, who will also speak in favor of reforms, but looking at it through more of a fiscal lens. Our third speaker, a late addition, will be Kevin Boyle, the managing editor of the Wave newspaper based in Rockaway, Queens. Uh, The next speaker is Sergei Manofsky from New York City, who will discuss affordability issues in the context of the city's comprehensive resiliency strategies, and our final panelist will be Professor Howard Kunruther from the Wharton School, who will tie all this together and will provide his own views on how he thinks the program should be structured, and then we'll open it up for Q&A. So with that said, I'm pleased to introduce Joshua Sachs, who, as I said, is the Legislative Director of the National Advocacy Center of the National Wildlife Federation. Mr. Sachs serves as NWF's Legislative Director, having Uh, helping set strategy and coordinate outreach to members of Congress on key uh, campaign priorities, including clean water and wetlands issues, energy policy, uh, and a number of others. He joined NWF in 2010 as a senior legislative representative for water resources campaigns. Uh, Prior to NWF, uh, he was the federal affairs associate for the Chesapeake Bay Foundation and a policy analyst at the Clean Air Council of Philadelphia. Uh, Mr. Sachs has a BA from Ithaca College and is currently pursuing an MA in Applied Economics at the Johns Hopkins University.
Good evening. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you all for, for having us and for coming to talk about this, this important and interesting topic. Um, before I begin, I think the question I get asked most often when I come to talk about flood insurance is, why do you care? Why, why does an environmental group with 4 million members who care about fishing and hunting and conservation care about insurance? Um, and I think the same question can be asked of, of a climate center at a law school, right? Why do they care about flood insurance? Um, so I'd like to start by talking about that a little bit and explaining why I'm here and why my organization has been working on flood insurance issues for at least 30 years. Um, and, and then we'll talk some about what's going on today and, and what we think needs to happen so that we can continue these needed and important reforms. So in terms of the environmental nexus, I think the first thing to recognize is there is tremendous synergy between what is good for the environment and what is good for wildlife and what is good for floodplains and also what is good for risk reduction and flood protection. They go hand in hand. So it starts with floodplains. This is the natural area where waters um, and land meet. It happens to be some of the most important ecological habitat we have. It also gives us other tremendous environmental benefits. These areas act as pollution buffers. So when it rains and, and pollution from our concrete parking lots and buildings runs towards our river systems, these areas absorb some of that pollution. These are the areas that let groundwater recharge. So our underground aquifers have water in them. That's important. Uh, it does all of those things. And then also, again, it, it provides buffers so when we have storm surges and things, there's places for the water to go. And most importantly to the National Wildlife Federation, it's where the animals live. Once we've established that nexus, there are other important parts. If we restore wetlands, if we have mangrove, um, pardon me, <laughs> if there are mangrove areas, if there are oyster reefs, all these different things, these all reduce storm surge. These all reduce flooding, and they give the environmental benefits my group cares about. Programs that encourage development in these areas, programs that make it cheaper to, to develop these areas, these mask the risk, and they hurt all these environmental benefits that I just mentioned. And to the climate issue, and we're at the Climate Center after all, um, sea level rise I is a problem right now. And all of our ecosystems are being impacted by that. And our ecosystems are also being impacted by warming water and warming air temperatures. There need to be places for wildlife to go. There needs to be places so adaptation can happen as climate change moves in. And by protecting these areas, we're, we're allowing or we're, we're reducing to some extent the impacts of climate change. So those are the reasons why a group like the National Wildlife Federation has been engaged in flood insurance and worked very hard for the reforms in bigger waters. And among those reforms, there are three, I think, that are significant and worth mentioning today. And, and the last one, of course, will, will get the most attention, and that's rates. But first, the bill created something called the Technical Mapping Advisory Council. And what that is, is, is FEMA will now convene a panel of experts from various resource agencies, from insurance companies, on and on. And those people are going to come together and say, let's look at how we, how we map our floodplains. Right now, it is an imperfect science, and FEMA does not do a great job at it. From a conservation perspective, there are parts that just get left out. As I said before, a wetland gives us tremendous benefit for flood protection. FEMA doesn't give any credit for a wetland on its flood map. Um, there are other elements to that. When we fill in rivers or we fill in wetlands, people do that for development reasons, but that can exacerbate downstream flooding. And right now, we don't take into account alterations of the landscape for what it will do downstream. So this council will now get together. They will convene. They will make recommendations on how we can do a better job in incorporating those things into our flood maps. And that's an important environmental victory. And ultimately, the hope is, as we better map these things, we will better protect these things. The next thing the bill did that is significant is it made it easier to do mitigation. When I say mitigation, I mean taking steps to reduce the impacts of flooding and storms. 
Um, but again, some of the best flood control money can buy is nature. Some of the best tools we have to reduce flooding are nature. So if there's more money for mitigation, hopefully not only will people be doing things like building levees or elevating homes, they will also be restoring green space. The third and final thing that the bill did, and, and my organization does believe the most significant thing the Bigger Waters bill did, is it did increase rates on an array of property types. And it did it in two categories, two buckets. I think that's worth explaining as, as we have this discussion tonight. The first category of properties who will have their rates increased, who already have had their rates increased, include secondary homes, vacation homes, business properties, properties we call severe repetitive loss properties. These are properties that have, have washed out where the program has paid out at least 50% of the value of the home, and properties that are in significant danger of, of continued flooding. Those properties all will see their rates go up. Many of them already have seen their rates begin to go up. There hasn't been a tremendous amount of clamor about that. There certainly are some people who are, who are unhappy, but it has not been the flashpoint. There are two other types of properties that also saw their rates go up in that. That's properties where the policy has lapsed. If you've let your policy lapse, you're going to go right to the full rate. Um, and for new home sales, when a home is sold, right now it goes up to the full rate. The second bucket or class of properties who are seeing their rates go up, and, and the one that has gotten the most attention of the public, are for primary residences and Unlike that first class I mentioned, the primary residences don't immediately see their rates go up. There's a trigger for that. And the trigger is, is the adoption of a new flood insurance map. The way that works is, on a routine basis, FEMA is supposed to go around the country and with a community look and see if their map is up to date. And if not, they begin a process to update that map. We're seeing some of that in New York right now. I'm sure some people have heard about that. The way that process is designed is FEMA does not come in and say, here's your new map. FEMA works with the community. They issue preliminary maps. There are public hearings. And ultimately, the map doesn't go final until a community with FEMA has adopted the map. The map or elements of that go into the, the town or the municipality's ordinances because zoning has to be impacted and things like that. So it's not as if this is put upon communities there is a process, and when the maps are wrong, there are challenges. Um, it's not a perfect process by any means, but there is a process. When the map goes final, when it is adopted, according to the law just passed, Bigger Waters, rates for primary residences will go up. So there are areas of the country that were remapped a year before Bigger Waters. They won't see this happen for years and years. Sometimes it can take 20 years for a new map. I think in parts of New York, you're operating on maps from the 1980s. Um, so there's a lot of lag time, but there are certain communities where this is happening now, and it's become an issue. I will come back to sort of what's going on with those rates and what we should do, but, but for a moment, I want to talk about why it's important that these rates are going up. And, and, and there are two reasons why a group like mine supports that. And the first is... It's not about the existing homes. It's about homes and places that haven't been built yet. Because again, for my organization, the pristine environments, those are the most important. So for areas that have not yet been developed, we believe that the flood insurance program prior to Bigger Waters was sending a market signal that was encouraging development. It actually made it cheaper than it truly should have been to develop and live in those areas. And it's not just the view of the National Wildlife Federation. That's also the view of the federal government. When Congress passed the National Flood Insurance Act of 1968, the act that created the program, they said the purpose of this act is to encourage state and local governments to make appropriate land use adjustments to constrict the development of land which is exposed to flood damage and minimize damage caused by flood losses. Congress knew that this had an impact on land use. Now, unfortunately, They've continued the subsidies, and it hasn't worked the way they wanted it to, but Congress understood when they first drafted this. The courts also have recognized this. National Wildlife Federation, in 1994, 
filed a lawsuit in District Court of Miami called Key Deer v. FEMA. The key deer is basically like a tiny deer, um, and it lives in the Florida Keys. It's an endangered species, and National Wildlife Federation alleged that the flood insurance program and the subsidies associated with it were causing development that was negatively impacting the key deer. And the court agreed, and they pushed the resource agencies, the Fish and Wildlife Service, to issue what we call biological opinion. And ultimately, that pushed changes to FEMA's community rating system, which how they give credit for doing good actions, um, and it pushed changes to the local ordinances. Several years later, the 11th Circuit um, upheld that decision. In 2011, that decision was upheld. And we have filed similar suits on behalf of sea turtles in Florida, uh, on behalf of the orca whale in the Puget Sound, and on behalf of salmon in the state of Oregon, and prevailed on each of those lawsuits. Point again is this program has a significant impact on how we develop. So that's established. That that speaks to sort of one category. But then you're probably saying, well, well, the rigmarole is all about these existing properties. So why does my organization care about properties that are already there? If we've already built a house, we've already lost the habitat. Well, that's true, but. Our hope is that by raising rates on existing properties, we're going to encourage people to take steps to mitigate. That's incredibly important. As we see climate change continue, as we see more severe and intense storms, it's important that people take steps to protect themselves. Part of our mission is also helping people adapt to climate change. Um, but again, when people mitigate, you can mitigate on many levels. And when you mitigate on community levels, and you provide open space or you restore wetlands and forests, that is tremendous both for the community and for the mission of my organization. Now, not everyone can do that. It's hard, and in, in, of course space is an issue. In Manhattan it's hard, but, but that's the case. Um, so now that you sort of understand where I'm coming from, let me talk for a moment about what's happening now. There's been a lot of consternation about rates going up, and particularly on primary residences. I get that. We don't want that to be the case. Um, and by no means is it the goal of the National Wildlife Federation to cause people hardship. Our goal is to send market signals, not a market shock, but a market signal that's going to encourage the good behavior I just described. We believe right now we can't know all of the impacts. We've seen a lot of news reports, but FEMA has said for these existing properties, they won't know the rates until sometime 2014. They don't anticipate having the rate tables and things till early 2014, and they don't anticipate rolling it out until late 2014. And again, even once it's rolled out, until your community adopts its new map, your rates will not begin to go up. So. Some in Congress have said, we believe the solution to this is to simply delay the rate increases. My organization would say that is not the correct solution. In fact, delay is not a solution at all. Delay is just delay. So for the what we believe is a small segment of people who are going to be negatively impacted, we would say today Congress should go ahead and make targeted changes that are going to help those people. But targeted changes that are also going to let the program continue to move forward, that we're going to continue to move rates forward and let people see their true risk. And we can go into some more detail about some of those solutions later, but things like means-tested subsidies, divorce from rates for people who can't afford the increase, targeting mitigation funds that the federal government is already giving out to areas that are being impacted by rate increases. Um, changing the arc of the increase for people and taking it from four years to 10 or more so there's plenty of time to mitigate. So hopefully the mitigation takes effect and they never have to see their maximum rate. These are all important steps. Um, I think my time is coming to a close, so I'll thank you all and happy to answer questions. And it's been a pleasure. <laughs> Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Steve Ellis, who is Vice President of Taxpayers for Common Sense, a D.C.-based 501c3 founded in 1995, uh, whose mission is to serve as a nonpartisan government watchdog 
seeking to ensure that the federal government spends taxpayer dollars responsibly and operates within its means. Taxpayers uh, for Common Sense seeks to increase transparency and expose and eliminate wasteful and corrupt subsidies, earmarks, and corporate welfare. Uh, Mr. Ellis joined taxpayers in 1999 and serves as a program manager and media and legislative spokesperson. He's been engaged on flood insurance issues for virtually his entire professional career. As a Coast Guard officer, he participated in the, international, in the interagency team charged with implementing post-Great Midwest flood of 1993 recommendations from the seminal Galloway Report on flood pain management. He's worked on both the 2004 and 2012 flood insurance reauthorizations. Thank you very much, and uh, thank you for the intro. I am Steve Ellis, uh, Vice President of Taxpayers for Common Sense, the national nonpartisan budget watchdog, and it's, it's good to be here. Uh, almost a century ago, my grandfather graduated from the journalism school here at uh, Columbia University, and uh, actually before I did that work in the Coast Guard, my first job out of uh, the academy was on a buoy tender, uh, the Sorrel, which is home ported at Governor's Island, um, which is basically the other end of the, of the one train uh, down by South Ferry, which incidentally flooded during Sandy. So there, we just lap, close that loop there. Um, so here is, uh, let's make sure I got this. Yep, there we go. All right, a little you know, operator error there. Um, you can see by our mission that uh, we don't have much to do. Uh, it's just a $3.5 billion federal budget that we're trying to watch. There's a dozen of us. Um, but uh, we are scrupulously accurate and persistently inconvenient, and we'll work with whomever will work with us, uh, even including this guy, Sachs, over here. Um, and, uh, you know, we try to be clear on what we regard as waste. Um, our concerns with flood insurance would really meet uh, the second and third um, bullets on this uh, particular list, um, where we're talking about unnecessary subsidies and also about long-term liabilities that are uh, long-term taxpayer liabilities. Um, we think that our nation's uh, whole approach to disaster spending, and that includes flood insurance, um, needs to be rethought. Um, but that's for another day. Um, there is a whole uh, uh, framework document on our website, www.taxpayer.net, little shameless plug there. Um, and so feel free to uh, take a look at that. Um, the key points that I'd like to make today are that um, the National Flood Insurance Program is broken uh, between the perverse incentives, cross subsidies, and taxpayer costs. It has uh, hu huge issues. Um, also, that uh, bigger waters is not a perfect bill. It's not the bill that I would have written. It's not the bill that I would say that a lot of members of Congress would have written. Um, but that doesn't mean that it's not a fixable bill and that there is, isn't responsible ways that we can address that. And then also, lastly, just to really point out that delay is not a solution. It doesn't fix any of the problems. It doesn't get us any closer to uh, fiscal solvency, and it actually creates a lot of other problems. Um, I pulled this, and you may not be able to read it. Um, it's a very prescient quote, I think, that was from the uh, Presidential Task Force on Federal Flood Control Policy in 1966, which was actually the body that was formed to make recommendations to Congress about, the, about creating a flood program. And I'll just read the last sentence. Um, for the federal government to subsidize low premium disaster insurance or provide insurance in which premiums are not proportionate to risk would be to invite economic waste of great magnitude. Well, that chicken came home to roost. The program's $24 billion in the hole to taxpayers. Um, here is where the program was in, in 2012, and this is pre-Bigger Waters, really, or just in that year, not talking about the impacts that happened either through Sandy or through Bigger Waters. Um, you know, you had a relatively small program, 5.5 million policies. Um, according to the last census, there's 130 million housing units in the United States, so it's still a, a small, um, important to certain people, but uh, uh, there, there are, uh, by estimate from FEMA through GAO, 20% of the properties in the program, so a little over a million, 1.1 million, um, we're getting explicit subsidies, paying 35 to 45 percent of risk-based rates. 
Um, the program was already underwater fiscally. It was $17 billion in the hole, mostly through the storms of 2005, not just Katrina, but Rita and Wilma, three of the most 10 costliest disasters in our country's history. Um, and it was hobbled by controversy. You know, you had a program, oh, and I should point out that just to put that $17 billion in context, it only took in about $3.6 billion in premium revenue. Um, so you're talking about, a, forgive the pun, a very underwater program. Um, and it also was hobbled by controversy. I mean, there were 17 extensions from it when, it in, when the 2004 bill expired. It lapsed twice. I mean, there were sort of a lot of problems with the program. Um, this is a graph from a, uh, a, a really great GAO report that um, if you're a nerd like me, you'd really like to read. Um, it's from July of this year. Um, and it looks at, and again, this is really small, I'm, I'm guessing, but um, it looks at where the uh, existing policies are, what states. This lists 25 states and, and Puerto Rico, and then also um, where the subsidized policies are. And so more than half of the flood insurance policies are in Florida, Louisiana, and Texas. A third, more than a third of them, are in Florida. And more than half of the subsidized policies are just in five states. Um, these are the explicitly subsidized policies, Florida, Louisiana, California, New Jersey, New York, and Texas. So, I mean, there's a lot of concentration into where these, these subsidies are going or where the program is operating. Um, what we testified, um, and we testified before Bigger Waters, um, on what we wanted to see in the flood insurance reform program was the biggest was phasing out um, subsidies, but also stronger reinforcement of purchase requirements, um, a greater emphasis on mitigation, which uh, you know hopefully reduces the, the potential risk and overall costs, not just from flood insurance, but actually overall disaster-related costs, sort of what we call pre-sponding to these disasters rather than responding. The development of private sector type options through either funding of a reserve fund that it can go to before going to the treasury, um, and then also to um, uh, maybe even the pur purchase of reinsurance, um, which is something that's often done, in the, it's done regularly in the insurance marketplace. Um, and then lastly, the maps are critical. And, and I don't think there's anybody that would suggest that not having accurate maps is okay. And that's something that we have to get right. It's critical to the program. We're strongly supportive of it, and that's an important part as well. Um, in that same GAO report uh, that I mentioned, they did an um, analysis of where the existing premium subsidies were. And they basically took the, the counties that had the highest amount of the premium subsidies and then the top five counties for premium subsidies in each of the uh, states. And so it ended up being 351 counties that represented 70% of, uh, of, of the subsidized policies and more than 40% of the overall policies. Um, and... Uh, you know, when you look at the, when you dig down into the data, you know, it looks, I know that counties can be diverse and that there are poorer pockets and more wealthy pockets, but what you see is, is that um, the preponderance, the vast majority of policies were in the more affluent counties. And I mean, to the extent that when you look at both uh, a quarter of them were in the top decile for both home value and median home value and medium income. And then um, the top two deciles in median home value um, had uh, over three quarters of the uh, of the policies total, and 69 percent, almost 70 percent of the subsidized policies. In contrast, the two bottom deciles for median home value were under a percent um, for both of those. So. Bigger Waters comes around, July 6, 2012, it passes. And so there's a series of reforms, and I won't go too much into it because uh, Josh did some of this. But um, essentially, you had, as he mentioned, the, the, the one bucket, the 205 bucket, which is a section of the law, um, it actually uh, increased the premiums at a 25% at a of the existing rate um, for second homes or non-residential properties, business properties, and severe repetitive loss properties, as Josh indicated. Um, and they were to increase at 25% of the existing rate. So if you had a $400 rate today, it'd be $500 next year. It would be $625 the year after that. Um, and so basically, the premiums for uh, primary residences that haven't been remapped, that haven't been sold, that haven't let their, prop their policies lapse, we're going to keep their subsidized premiums and until any of those factors uh, changed or if they had repetitive losses. 
And so this is really small to see, I know, or I'm guessing. But anyway, um, what, you, what this slide is also from that GAO report that I like to cite. Um, and it just shows the breakdown of the various policies. The five and a half million is the top blue bar. And then you notice that the vast majority of policies are not being affected by the 205 reforms, um, at least not immediately. And according to FEMA, only 5% of uh, policies are actually seeing a, an effect today. Um, the other reforms, and there was a series of these, and I'll just kind of run through them, but the other second bucket that Josh mentioned was the 207 reforms, which have been more of the, uh, the flashpoint, and that is upon the adoption of a new flood insurance rate map, which, note I said adoption, it's not foisted upon the community. There is a negotiation. Now if the community rejects it repeatedly after a year, it will go into effect, but it is a negotiation between the community and FEMA to make sure that it is actually right, um, that the rates would increase at 20% of the new premium, the new risk-based premium. And this is a key point. And this is something that I think even the authors of the bill would re recognize that they did not uh, realize. Whereas the 205 increases at 25% of today's premium, the 207 properties, the, the, the new rate map properties are increasing at 20% of the new premium. So if there was a big jump, you would see a big jump uh, in your annual increase in the premium. Um, and so that's something that, as I get into, you'll see that we were talking about it. Next is the home sales, which, is, which Josh alluded to, which is essentially upon transfer, the new risk-based rates go into effect. And then also there was a, um, they increased the amount that could be increased each year. And they also uh, made it so that there was a, a to pre-fund a reserve fund, one of the reforms that we wanted, um, a 5% surcharge on all policies. Um, there were increased penalties to lenders. It went from about $250 or $350 to $2,000 for not enforcing the rules. Um, uh, there was also, um, and this is a more significant change than I think a lot of people recognize, um, FEMA is supposed to charge premiums that in aggregate would equal their average historical loss year with catastrophic loss years factored in. FEMA heavily discounted years like 2005, even 2011, because the Midwest floods, 1993. Um, and so 2005 counted for 0.01% in their factoring here. Bigger Water said no. Average historical loss years, average historical loss year, you have to take into account that it's catastrophic. So this is one side of the equal sign, one side of the premium equal sign. And so if you adjust premiums down on the other side for a certain uh, category of properties, other properties are going to have to have their premiums go up to get to this total average historical loss year number. And so that's something that is, a, that is an issue that um, um, we're going to see. And so basically holding, it's, there, there is somebody that is harmed. And, and, you know, there's no free lunch, and there's no free lunch in the flood program, and it hits taxpayers, and it hits other uh, people who are paying full risk-based rates. And then also the technical mapping council that uh, Josh mentioned. So you have bigger waters passed in July. Now you have um, in... Uh, October, as I'm sure all of you are painfully aware of that same year, you have Sandy. And so you had a program, remember I said there was about $17 billion in debt before Sandy. Um, well, now it, it needed to increase its borrowing authority. It was capped at borrowing for the Treasury at $20 billion. Um, just to keep it in mind, before the 2005 storms, the cap for the flood insurance program borrowing was at $1.5 billion. Um, and so they had to get an increase in the borrowing authority from Congress. They got a $9.7 billion increase, which now takes it to a little bit north of $30 billion. Um, it's something that took a big fight to get through Congress. I mean, it was very painful, and it was a painful vote for a lot of lawmakers, even though that was to pay what we owe. That wasn't like really expanding the program. That was people who had been paying their premiums, playing by the rules, and that, that we, and we still had to fight to get that through Congress. Not something that we opposed. We supported the increase in the borrowing authority, think it was responsible. But we also thought that you have to take the medicine to go along with that. Um, and so uh, the debt to the Treasury to date is in excess of $24 billion. That will continue to grow. Um, I don't know exactly where it will end up, but uh, it will continue to grow as claims are paid off. Um, and uh, then also, I think the other real key thing that came out of that was that notifying, notif noting that um, 2005 was not an anomaly, that these type of storm events, uh, maybe not to the scope and scale of Katrina, which had a lot of other elements into it, but certainly Rita and Wilma, certainly Sandy, these are in our future, and that we cannot simply ignore that that is going to happen. I think that's the other major uh, legacy of, uh, of Sandy. So we actually, and just to 
little tiny sidebar, we do analysis of spending bills, and so we did a whole analysis on our website of all this, this $50 billion, there's $50 billion in our appropriations in the Sandy Bill, and we, we put that all out there, and that's also available, a second shameless plug, on our website, www.taxpayer.net. Um, and then uh, now you have people raising issues with bigger waters. It started spinning up, and you had a lot of talk about astronomical rate increases, uh, $28,000, $40,000, even $50,000 rate increases. You had uh, cr criticisms that the maps are inaccurate. You had um, you know, the issues around the removal of decades, in some cases decades worth of, uh, of subsidies uh, for grandfather properties, and then you had the sale trigger. Um, well, not surprisingly, we have issues with the bigger water issues. Um, and uh, it's hard to pin down the actual rate increases. And you know, there's a lot of talk and there's a lot of speculation and, and, and that has been flying around about what are these rate increases. And, uh, and, and, and I would say some hysteria. And I'm not saying that people are misrepresenting. I just think that people are looking at fact char charts and numbers and coming up with things that, that aren't necessarily reflecting in, in reality. And I'll just put it to point, and that is, if you have a $30,000 premium, the maximum you can insure your property is for $250,000 in, uh, in the flood insurance program. And, uh, so, and then you can do $100,000 for contents. That means that FEMA is basically saying that every 10 years they expect it to be a total loss, that we're going to pay out the entire thing. I would argue that there are some bigger issues there in addition to the high premiums about where the home is located in the risk that's related there, or the map is wrong, and then that should be dealt with. Um, also, that the phase-in for the rate increases, they started for the 2005 properties at, October, at the beginning of this year. The new map properties, FEMA has indicated, aren't going to be until late 2014, which means it'll probably be 2015, really, before any of those are seeing new, new uh, premiums, so people aren't seeing those yet. And then also, I point out, as recently as 2011, the FEMA director indicated that properties were being mapped out of the floodplain as much as were being mapped into the floodplain. Um, so what do we want to do? Well, we want targeted, uh, time-limited, fair, and fiscally responsible solutions. So we think that you could do some certain things that would, would, would help out, and that is um, fa extend the ramp in on the phase in. So for instance, with the uh, 2000 and the 207 properties, the remap properties, again, like I said, I think there was a drafting uh, error that could be addressed. We could put everything on the same glide path, 25% of the existing, 25% uh, of the existing premium, whether it's new home sales, whether it's a second home, or whether it's remap property. Um, that we could also have this means tested, uh, oh, reset the start as well for um, home sales, just basically base it on the new legislation instead of being the day after Bigger Waters was enacted. Um, we can have some means tested assistance, and that could be done either through some sort of a voucher or, or direct assistance program that could be paid for through the program, um, or it could be caps on the annual increase. But so continuing us on the glide path of getting towards risk based rates. Increased mitigation assistance, directing FEMA to uh, provide up to 25% of their existing funding for mitigation to properties that are facing high uh, premiums. And then also uh, making sure that we give full credit for uh, flood protection that exists, uh, which is Josh also me mentioned. Now, there are a lot of proposals out there to delay. Uh, there is a, a big proposal in the House and a big proposal in the Senate that have a lot of uh, sponsorship. Um, the main proposal would actually delay it for four years, which, to be clear, Bigger Waters, the flood insurance program as a whole, expires September 30th, 2017. So you can do the math. If you go four years after that, uh, four years from today, it's actually longer. The delay is actually longer than the reform is. Um, so it's really about gutting some of the heart of the reforms. There's also in the, in the Department of Homeland Security appropriations bills, one-year delays um, on, on spending money on mapping. That's the, the DH, FEMA is part of DHS. And a few other proposals, including one of my favorites, Mr. Capuano from Massachusetts, who wants to maintain subsidies for uh, uh, second homes that are valued up to a million dollars. I would like to have a first home valued up to a million dollars. Um, but delay doesn't solve the issues. Um, it, doesn't, it doesn't actually uh, deal with the issues around uncertainty. Um, because we don't know what's going to happen after four years. This is all contingent on FEMA doing, uh, doing an affordability study. And so we don't know what is going to actually happen. Um, we also, uh, uh, it, it speeds up insolvency of the overall pro program. And so we've already seen that it was having challenges actually uh, uh, dealing with um, uh, getting increased borrowing authority. And this is not me saying, this is the Congressional Budget Office that's saying it will increase uh, insolvency, the nonpartisan uh, scorekeeper, if you would, for the, for the Congress. Um, the cross subsidies would increase, as I had indicated before, and it also reduces the incentives to mitigate. And I think most importantly, um, holding down people's premiums doesn't 
doesn't stop the floodwaters from coming. It doesn't reduce risk. And it doesn't, so it, it seems almost incomprehensible to me that we would have our elected officials saying, we're going to keep subsidies in place that are going to keep people in harm's way. And that we need to have solutions and we need to have an approach that is thoughtful, that helps advance the ball and build on those reforms in bigger waters, but that doesn't actually gut them. Uh, with that, I am done. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. We're now going to hear a very different perspective from Kevin Boyle, who lives a block from the ocean on the Rockaways in Queens, one of the areas hardest hit by Hurricane Sandy. Mr. Boyle is the managing editor of the Wave newspaper, which is based in the Rockaways, where he frequently writes on Hurricane Sandy, storm recovery, and flood insurance. Since March, he's been covering and writing editorials about the implications of bigger waters. Uh, the Wave uh, was founded in 1893 and is New York City's oldest weekly newspaper. Mr. Boyle worked there from 1994 to 2000 and then returned following Sandy. Uh, in the intervening years, he taught media studies and English at Kingsborough Community College and the College of New Rochelle and was an academic advisor at Queensborough Community College. Welcome. <clears throat> Hello, everybody. I am a uh, flood insurance uh, subsidy baby, I suppose. Uh, but I'm not a complete pig. I drove here. I didn't take the subway, which is also subsidized, as you know. I didn't take a federal highway here, fortunately, because those are subsidized, too. And this, because I'm a uh, considered guest, I won't bring up anything about student loans and how they're subsidized, or Pell Grants. The point is, you know, subsidies aren't in a vacuum. You know, Everybody hates them when you don't benefit, but there are a lot of indirect beneficiaries. So student, you know, student loans um, allow students to get college degrees. That gives them more power, um, earning power. That helps the economy. So there's some good out of that. We get it. An employer needs a workforce. So it's a good thing that his employees can take the train. That's subsidized every day and get to work. So he benefits. So... There's four points I want to make. One, subsidies aren't in a vacuum. And here's the, the subsidy that Rockaway is enjoying. We have flood insurance policy. So we can build a town, a community, with businesses and taxpaying base. And we've been doing it for more than 100 years. We've had, we did have Sandy, but long before that, we didn't have any kind of uh, thing to compare. So we've been a taxpaying community with a workforce that um, if it's driven away, you'll feel it. You don't realize that you are enjoying the benefits of us paying taxes, sales tax, and businesses, but we are. To what extent you'll feel it, I don't know, and it's theoretical to you, of course, but you will feel it. You can't chase away an entire tax base um, with, uh, by killing our subsidies. I, again, before you um, reach a verdict on it, consider your own subsidies. You get them. Um, another point I want to raise is that um, I want to call out the red her herring here about the you know, six million dollar house on the Hamptons. That's getting the, uh, you know, the Wall Street Journal, um, as Mike mentioned, uh, wrote about such things this week. It's absurd. You know, it's a red herring. It's really not what we're talking about. The people who need flood insurance live in Rockaway. They live in Gerritsen Beach. They live in Atlantic City. They live in poor towns everywhere. These are established communities that have middle class and poor people. Some poor people, they have, they're homeowners, so maybe they're not poor by some definition, but some of those houses have been passed down, and they've had to take out equity lines of credit to pay for a new roof. Those people exist in Rockaway, but now they're facing a, a flood insurance policy that will bankrupt them or drive them to foreclosure. So to me, it's a, a complete red herring. And the other thing about a million-dollar house in Cape Cod by the um, person in Massachusetts, some people use second homes as investments. That's their, that's their 401. That's their annuity. You know, um, they're not necessarily, maybe they're rich, but on, uh, they don't necessarily have pensions. So some of those vehicles, I don't think you can dismiss them as, oh, it's a million dollar house, second home. Again, some of these people don't have um, uh, deferred compensation plans and all that, a lot of which are subsidized. Again, you know, your 401s and other things. So. It, it's easy to, you know, have reflexive, negative uh, reactions to such things, but there's layers to them all. And I think 
I was impressed, of course, by our first two speakers, but I think they made the case for me. Should, should Congress step in? Yeah, that's what they should do. They laid out all the problems with it and dismissed them at the same time, but the problems are what I'm here about, too. FEMA doesn't do a great job. They came back with, I think, um, well, their maps were challenged and they made changes. Makes me question the actuarial rates. Who's to say their rates are accurate and valid? Have they been tested? I'll use my own case. I don't, uh, I can say I'm pure in this because I technically don't need flood insurance. I'm in a low risk zone, soon to be changed to an A zone. I don't have a mortgage, so I don't really need flood insurance. So I can say I'm as pure as I can be. But my house has a basement, and it's um, flooded one time during Sandy since 1940. That, this is, again, you know, the rates are not really out there. Well, FEMA itself has put them on their own website. I'm using FEMA-issued rates. So when I hear, oh, the rates aren't really set or anything like that, I'm only using what FEMA tells me. If you're four feet below the advisory base flood elevation, you will face a premium of $9,500 a year. If you have a basement, you're more likely to be eight or 10 feet below. Your first floor might be just the right um, level. So happens a lot of people in New York and elsewhere have basements that are used for offices, bedrooms, et cetera. Even if they're not used for bedrooms or offices and you just have your hot water heater down there, that's considered a living area, so you're, taxed, you're, you're charged on that. So. My 9,500, because I'm double four feet to eight feet, that's, let's see, $19,000 a year after tax money. So I have to make 30 something thousand dollars to pay that 19,000? Is this theoretical or abstract? I don't know, but FEMA's put it on their website. So the, the laughable part about it is, is nobody's gonna pay 20 or $30,000 a year. If you can afford that, you're gonna self-insure, you're gonna go to Lloyd's of London, or you're just going to take the hit and say, you know what, I'll fix the house when it's necessary. So the National Flood Insurance Program doesn't get funded that way either. The other people, they just won't be able to afford it. So they dri drive down the market and, again, destroy that tax base, destroy com entire communities. So my point about FEMA is that they should be challenged on these things just like they were on their flood maps. I don't trust them on it. And that's where a delay comes in. That's why... These things, we can't assume they'll be fixed because, oh, let's just keep implementing everything. Let's not have a delay. No, let's have a delay so we can fix it. If that's the question here, then I think the, the answers are apparent. These things have to be fixed before they're implemented. Um, these actuarial numbers, by the way, real or not, on FEMA's, uh, were not revealed to um, members of Congress before they passed bigger waters. Shame on them for not knowing more about the law. They'll be the first ones to say, in a lot of cases, they admit it themselves. Peter King from Long Island said, seemed like good legislation at the time. He said that to me directly. It was a mistake, other people have said. Um, Mary Landro from Louisiana said she voted for it knowing it was going to be bad, but it was tucked in another, it was tucked in a transportation bill that was important to pass. So the excuses are there, sure, but the other fact is that FEMA didn't reveal exactly what numbers they were talking about. I'm not sure if members of Congress facing um, looking at somebody like me, oh, he's got a basement, he's going to have to pay $20,000 a year in, in insurance. Is he going to pay it? Probably not. He's going to bail out of that policy, which is the other thing. If you, can't, if you don't have a mortgage, you're not going to be encouraged to join the program. The NFIP wants people in the program. They want, it, they want people to pay. But if the rates are so absurd and you don't need to, you're not going to buy flood insurance. And uh, FEMA is a, it's a mess on a couple of other levels. I asked for um, the grandfathering clause. I asked about it. It's the kind of organization, you know, you'll ask one person one time in FEMA and get one answer, and you'll ask it again, and you'll get another answer. Well, the question about grandfathering came up. I said, what about grandfathering? Can you or can you not grandfather? They said, well, you can assign the policies. And I have this in an email from a supervisor, an underwriting supervisor of FEMA. You can assign them. You can't transfer them. I know it's the law, you know, law department so you can distinguish the difference. But um, so to me, it seems, wow, that could be pretty big. If, uh, because when I sell my house, um, the new person, the way it's most people understand, starts at the new uh, flood A rate. But if I could assign my um, X policy to them, which is a preferred r low risk, that's a score for me. But is it really, is it true? I don't know. FEMA gave me one answer, and other times they say, oh, no, well, grandfather was out. So it's another example of why uh, Congress should step in and fix things. 
you know, FEMA is okay with implementing rate hikes, but they're not okay with implementing the affordability study that they're mandated to do. And I mean a micro and a macro affordability study, not whether I can afford it. Big deal. I'm talking about if cities can afford it, if towns can afford it. I, it should be a macro look at this, that if Rockaway is chased out by flood insurance, if they kill this town, they kill other towns, is that an affordability question that the city is going to, uh, well, city and state, are they, are they you know, prepared for this? Or is the affordability study going to address that? I hope so. But again, FEMA, they're dragging their feet uh, on the affordability study and with no signs of them conducting it. You know, they're, so what's their answer? Oh, council says we can implement parts of the act, but we don't have to do the affordability stuff. Congress should step in. That's what I'm asking for. You know, again, I'm only going by the rates that FEMA put on their own website. They had a little house and a little fake water next to it, a few or four feet this. So I'm not dreaming this up. And um, just one, one point that Steve raised that I'm not sure if people clear. If you, got, if you bought a house the day after Bigot Waters, you're in the new zone. You know, you, if you purchase flood insurance immediately, um, you are at actuarial rates that they want to put in there. So um, it's one of these things that if people had, to, you know, bought flood insurance, they, guess what, uh, young couple want to, they go out and buy a house. The bank figures out their mortgage and say, you know what, they can scrape by and do this. But little do they know this, this flood insurance uh, time bomb is in front of them. That's the kind of thing. It's not, you know, you want to talk about million-dollar anecdotes. I've got more anecdotes than that about people who are going to be struggling because of this, regular normal people who, you know, went into it with, uh, with the bank, filled out all the forms, worked hard and all that, but they had this time bomb. The other thing is, you know, we've been in the communities, you know, you talked about the original um, flood insurance program and why it was enacted. Well, you know, a lot of things can be argued the same way. You can pick holes in them now. But let's, take, let's get rid of that highway because it's subsidized and how people are supposed to work. So, that, you know, there was a, a compact, a promise somewhat, that they encourage coastal development. And I bought my house with flood insurance, and other people built the community with a subsidized program in place. It's changing the game a little late for a lot of people. And, and that's why it should be delayed. That's why things have to be considered. This is a complicated issue. It can't be like, oh, you know, $20,000 $20, a year, tough. And lastly, uh, I want to talk about a few remedies. That's the other thing that they're not allowing. A couple were mentioned today, but you know what? We should get the remedies done before. That's why, it's, that's why Congress is supposed to step in. We're not supposed to wait and wait because that, then the remedies never come. I want to point out there are, um, you're locked in with deductibles. You, have to, you only get $250,000 plus $100,000 in, in contents, which again, if you have a $6 million house, what's that $250,000 going to do for you? But your deductible is uh, $1,000 or 2000 most people really don't want to even care if they insure their hot water heater or their furnace. It's the equivalent of a crappy car. Most people want to just have a uh, catastrophic insurance that um, just in case your house is washed off its foundation, which is rare. Even in a flood, it's rare. But there's no room for any of the deductible. I, if I had my choice and I was getting flood insurance, I'd have a $30,000 a 30, deductible. I'll take care of my basement or whatever happens. Up to $30,000 all day, pay after that. And then the rate in that case might be actually something that's reasonable. I say, all right, I'll take the risk. I, I, I assume I'm not a denier about rising sea levels and all that. That's the thing. I'm looking for remedies here. But I'm not, I don't want our town being killed by this. Well, my town, anybody else's town. Flood proofing is not allowed. Well, I mean, you can flood proof, sure. It's encouraged, but it doesn't do anything for your insurance rate. You can put blocks, you know, a blast in your windows, and you can build a wall around your house. Flood proofing doesn't. They call it mitigation, but it doesn't. They want you to elevate only on your house. Flood proofing doesn't do anything. There should be more frequent mapping. You know, uh, we heard about uh, dunes and oysters and all that. Well, it so happens that Rockaway is getting a new dune system, probably jetties in a few years, and we will be getting oysters and seagrass on Jamaica Bayside. If FEMA takes another 30 years to remap, though, what good is it going to do us? We're going to be telling them, hey, we have these pr protective measures in place. Hey, we have these protective measures in place. When are you coming back? Oh, well, we've got to do another part of the country first. And, you know, in, 19, in the 60s, New York State was faced, New York City actually was faced with um, 
I wouldn't say a similar problem, but it's uh, analogous, I think. You couldn't get fire insurance in the 60s because the cities were burning down. So New York State um, basically formed their own insurance program. And I'm not quite sure if it fits here, but it's one of those things that should be considered, and by Congress stepping in, they can help figure it out. You know, one of the other things, maybe we realize, you know what, we live at the coast, we should pay more. Okay, I, we, I, we, most of us get that. How about banks charge us an extra point on the mortgage, and that point goes to, uh, towards the NFIP? I don't know if that works, but to me, it's one of those things that should be talked about. You know, the average house in New York is, what, 700000 extra point, and that would add up. And people then could say, you know what, all right, the mortgage is going to cost me more. It's going to go to the flood insurance program, but I'll get to live there. It won't collapse the real estate um, you know, uh, market. Um, and, fi and finally, planned obsolescence. You know what? My house is built in 1940. Well, next time you do a remodeling job, you're going to have to raise it. You're going to have to take the utilities out of the basement and all that. These things are not being talked about. I think there are remedies. Instead of just killing a town, I think the remedies should be worked at. And the way it's going to be worked out is if Congress steps in. Thanks. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Sergei Manofsky, who is the director of the New York City Mayor's Office of Long-Term Planning and Sustainability, where he manages citywide energy policy and oversees the city's comprehensive sustainability effort, Plan NYC. Dr. Manofsky leads a team of engineers, economists, policy analysts, architects, and attorneys that conducts innovative research and manages key programs on energy and climate. His office oversees research and implementation of key climate resilience measures, uh, works closely with FEMA on updating flood, flood maps for the city, and brings together utilities, climate scientists, and engineers to assess the risks to critical infrastructure and evaluate cost-effective mitigation measures. Dr. Manofsky serves as chairman of the New York City Energy Policy Task Force and chairman of the New York City Energy Efficiency Corporation. He's also an adjunct professor here at uh, Columbia next door in the School of International Affairs. <clears throat> Michael, thank you, and uh, uh, really enjoyed listening to very eloquent speakers. Um, for those of you who aren't in the law school, you know, Michael uh, Gerard is really a legendary figure in environmental and climate law. Um, he uh, is one of the few uh, academic lawyers who is universally respected by uh, climate scientists, trial lawyers, administrative law judges, a whole group of people who work in this field. So uh, thank you for the invitation. And over the past year, we've been working side by side, actually evaluating <coughs> uh, utilities um, in our utility rate case, looking at cost effective measures. Uh, to really um, protect our utility system with the next generation of investments, looking at storms and, and other and other measures. So it's been uh, it's been a pleasure working with you, and I see a lot of old friends, uh, Klaus Jacob. I also want to introduce two people on our team who are really the brains behind this. Uh, Leah Cohn, she's our deputy director uh, on federal uh, issues, and and um, Catherine Grieg, who uh, just joined us recently. She's senior policy advisor. Uh, just I just want you guys to get to know them because. Um, Leah, um, not only you know during the storm, uh, she helped place 230 emergency generators uh, across the city. Uh, she worked like 20-hour days, and uh, she also uh, helped uh, helped us work with FEMA actually before Sandy uh, to to urge them to update the flood maps, which we knew were inaccurate. And uh, and so so Leah Leah has been a tremendous part of this team. And Catherine joined us recently from uh, the, actually the federal task force. So she's. Uh, heading our, our flood insurance work. So this is really, I'm just a, a vessel for uh, for their work here. So thank you. Um, so I'm just going to... Where does this go? Yeah, I wonder if I said so. Doesn't seem to be happy. Let's go one more. Yeah. Did it? Just a little. Ooh, wow, I can barely see that. <laughs> oh, it's backwards. That's interesting. Let's see. Hmm. Oh, this is the old one. Okay. All right. Well, I'm just going to. Okay. Well, this is an old slide deck. So I'm, I'm just going to go give you my um, 
Okay. All right. So just some perspectives on the storm before we talk about flood insurance. And what I'm going to what I'm going to talk about is, uh, you know, our perspectives on NFIP and where some of the reform efforts start to break down when you get to big, dense coastal uh, environments and some of the key data gaps that we have been looking at. Um, but just some perspectives on Sandy. You know, first, infrastructure systems are linked. If you look at what happened during Sandy, you know, 44 people died, seven hospitals were evacuated, uh, 800,000 people uh, customers lost power, which was a quarter of the population. Um, the entire gasoline supply chain collapsed. It was a really catastrophic event. And, and so one of the lessons that we've taken, uh, you know, obviously about how infrastructure systems are linked. You know, second one is really, you know, don't fight the last war. You know, you need to be prepared not only for the, 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 the last storm event but the next one and also heat waves. If you look at over the past couple of years, 2010, 2011, 2012, we had historic heat waves with historic peak load days in the grid. We also had uh, Irene and Sandy. So that's something our team has been uh, spending a lot of time on looking at, not just, uh, not just Sandy, but other types of events. The other one, uh, the third issue is, you know, multi-layered strategies are the most effective defense. So our, our Sandy plan that the mayor issued in, uh, in June, it's a really a $19 billion plan looking at a uh, $3.5 billion coastal plan, looking at coastal measures, both gray and green uh, infrastructure, uh, measures that utilities should undertake, building codes. So it's really multi-layered. You've got to look at the whole city. Um, the other lesson was, is that building standards do work. If you look at uh, one-story uh, combustible pre-1961 structures, they were, uh, they were eight, only 18% of buildings that were inundated, but they were almost three-quarters of the destroyed structures. So we know that building codes can work. Um, new developments like Auburn by the Sea, uh, were virtually unscathed uh, uh, during the storm. The other issue we know is, you know, local communities uh, need to be equipped with, with resources, so neighborhoods with resources and, and strong ties can, can recover more quickly. Uh, and, and finally, you know, we are vulnerable now, and, um, you know, we always have to have some humility about predicting the future, but we do know, based on the latest climate science, and this is where Klaus and, 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 and Ray and some others who have been on our uh, New York City panel of climate change, what we try to do is have climate scientists speak with regulators. I think they used to not really speak the same language. Um, and I think we, we're, we're getting to a point now where, where um, we're able to really think about how to cost effectively uh, um, uh, make investments that, that mitigate against climate change. And I think that, that's one of the big lessons that we learned as well. Um, I don't know what you guys can see here, but let me uh, – I'm just going to skip through some of these guys. Hmm. I'm very sorry about this. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so this is not, uh, for some reason, it doesn't have the slides that we want. You know, I'm just going to talk through it. No slides, guys. Um, <clears throat> all right, so we, we uh, no, it, just, it goes in a circle, the one, four slides. It's okay. So, so really, we asked, uh, the Rand Corporation helped us really answer four questions. It's really a preliminary scoping of the flood insurance uh, issue in the city. You know, first, wh what was a fl flood insurance flood insurance uptake uh, before Sandy, uh, and then what are the consequences due to uh, bigger waters and the updated flood insurance maps uh, for the city? <clears throat> and, and third, what are the um, what options should pol policymakers consider uh, to address increases in insurance premiums? And finally, you know, what are the data uh, and analyses that should be collected conducted you know well into 2014? You know, our team's going to be working on this uh, with communities uh, well into next year. This is a, a big fundamental issue, as was laid out by everybody on today's panel. Um, so first, what, you know, what, what, what are the, the basic structure? What's the basic structure of the NFIP in, in New York City? Well, in New York City, it, it serves pri primarily the one to four family residential market. Roughly 86% of, of policies are in the one, one to four family uh, sector. Uh, the rest are in other residential, and then you have some private insurance in the commercial uh, sector. <clears throat> the, the other interesting thing is the uptake of flood insurance in New York City is roughly 55 percent in the 100-year uh, floodplain. Um, it is a little bit higher for those with mortgages, roughly 65 percent. For those without mortgages, the uptake is roughly 20, uh, 21 percent. The national figure on that is 49 percent. Um, the the other uh, important figure is is um, for for those uh, the, the pre firm structures those before built before 1983 those are the ma majority of of uh, structures in the policy and so the, the, the problem there of course is since FEMA doesn't have elevation data for pre firm structures those are um, th those th those not necessarily reflect risk and, and and those are the majority of policies roughly 
uh, 8,000 of the policies, and they tend to be higher. The premiums are roughly uh, $1,800 per policy. Um, another, another finding is that <clears throat> there's, we typically get the question, you know, what does the coastline look like? Is it demographically very different from the rest of New York City? And, and the answer is, unfortunately, I wish I could show you, but the answer is that uh, the, a cross-section of either the 2007 firm map or the, or, the, or the PWM, they look pretty much like the rest of New York City. Um, the, the, the income levels are, are, are not that different. And so what that means is uh, up to 37 percent of, of households in, in, in the latest, in the PWM, the preliminary work map, are likely low-income households. So, so high premiums are going to make insurance unaffordable uh, in, in, potentially in, in these communities. Um, a couple other, <clears throat> I'm going to skip through some of this. We, we did some analysis looking at uh, uh, ex sample structures because we don't have the data. We don't have the data on every building and how, how uh, the statistics uh, work out. That's going to be part of our sampling next year. But what we did is, is some analysis on the data that we had that showed that, for example, a, a pre-firm structure where the lowest floor is under six, six feet below uh, the BFE, uh, the average premium today might be $1,800. Uh, the possible premium with full risk rates for one such, such structure could be closer to 6000 And if you look at a current average property value of $350,000, the potential change in that property value might be on the order of $100,000 potentially. And for uh, a, a household earning roughly $75,000 a year, uh, the, the percent of household income uh, taken up by flood insurance might be greater than 7 to 8%. That's just one example. I mean, more work needs to be done, and this is why I, I'm posing this as an issue of, of, from our perspective, research and data gaps that need to be gathered. Um, the other, <clears throat> the other um, perspective is that uh, if you look at the latest uh, preliminary work maps, roughly double the number of one to four family structures are in the PWMs. So it's expanded the number of, of households uh, who, who are, now, are now affected by this. And then, then if you look at climate change, unfortunately, I don't have the maps, but we did, uh, you know, modeling with our climate scientists to look at what the floodplain could look like uh, in the what we're calling the 90th percent confidence interval in the 2020s and 2050s with the best available science. Um, in, in into the 2050s, you get another uh, 50 to 60 percent increase of those one to four family homes as you expand horizontally uh, what the floodplain looks like, and you're also expanding vertically how, how deep it is. So uh, it's, it's, it's going to be an increasing uh, issue for the city. And um, if you look at, uh, according to the latest preliminary work maps, the base flood elevations uh, are expected to increase roughly one to four feet across New York City. And you might ask, well, why, why one to four feet? That's not all sea level rise. I mean, you have improved modeling, more precise topographical LIDAR data, uh, additional storm data since 1983, um, more synthetic storms and actual storms that have occurred uh, in the Atlantic. Uh, you, you do have some sea level rise uh, and some subsidence. And the combination of all those things, on average, we're seeing a relative uh, mean elevation increase of, of 2.3 feet between the, the, uh, the base flood elevation in the 2007 firm and the 2013 uh, PWM. Um, unfortunately, I can't show you, but we, we've also done some, um, some basic cash flow analytics and, and some, some trying to understand, you know, different types of homes, you know, an attached one to two home one or two family home in Red Hook, a detached one or two family home in Garrison Beach or, or Midland Beach. And we're, we're, we're just basic estimates of the premiums. Ah, okay. Let's back up. Hmm. Okay, this is, this is the, with the sea level rise. Sorry. So these are the, the preliminary work maps right now. You're going to see the increase in the one to four family homes of uh, roughly double. Um, this is with sea level rise. You can see the expansion in the Jamaica Bay area and elsewhere, and <clears throat> this is the this is the uh, <clears throat> increase in base flood elevation across the city. And you'll see some differences in boroughs. <clears throat> Part of that is methodological, but you see on average in New York City a, a 2.3 feet foot increase. Hmm. <laughs> so these are the three examples I mentioned. In, uh, in, in Red Hook, Garrison uh, Beach, and Midland Beach, where the, the annual premium increase, in, in this case, and the, again, th these are examples, could be between, you know, 2000 to 8000 
uh, dollars. And so the next step for us is really to understand how many of these types of properties uh, fall into each scenario across a 100-year floodplain. So really beginning to understand um, the impact on, on a city this large, this diverse, this complex. This is where some of the, the theory starts to break down a little bit. Um, so as far as next steps, I mean, really, number one is reduce risk. So, so the $19 billion plan that we've evaluated, as I mentioned, looks across infrastructure classes and buildings. And so the first effort is to, is to reduce risk. Uh, the second aspect is, is, is to, in fact, and, and this reflects on what everybody's mentioned, it really improve risk-based risk, risk pricing. Um, you know, working with FEMA to test and incorporate risk mitigation strategies uh, when pricing premiums, both at the neighborhood level and at the household level. The neighborhood level, that would in include the Army Corps and FEMA working together to, to understand the flood protection measures and how they, uh, how they would impact uh, flood insurance. At the household level, you know, 40% of the city's buildings cannot be elevated. So the risk mitigation strategy that currently exists, the simplest one to implement, is not available uh, to 40% of, of households. Or, or buildings, uh, mind you, um, and so and so those buildings don't get recognized for durable construction and so forth. So so we need to work together with FEMA to to, to look at mitigation measures. And the other one is really developing solutions. And, and and this is really early on in our process. And I would defer. We have a lot of experts here who have thought through uh, these issues, including you know low interest loans, tax credits and grants, higher deductible, lower premium insurance products. Uh, I think we have to look at the whole suite of of products out there. And then finally, you know, a big effort of ours is really to inform the public, launch a public education cam campaign regarding the risks and mitigation, uh, and that's really for, you know, the, uh, much of our 2014 work uh, will, be, will be devoted uh, to that. So, uh, Michael, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak. Thank you very much. Um, our final speaker is Professor Howard Kundruther of the Wharton School of the University of Pennsylvania. Professor Kundruther is one of the nation's foremost experts on insurance and risk management. He's the James G. Dinan Professor and Professor of Decision Sciences and Business and Public Policy at Wharton and co-directs the Wharton Risk Management and Decision Processes Center. He has a longstanding interest in the ways that society can better manage natural hazards. Among other honors, Professor Kundruther is the is a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science and a distinguished fellow of the Society for Risk Analysis. Uh, he recently served on the National Academy of Science National Research Council's panel on increasing national uh, resilience to hazards and disasters and also served on the New York City panel on climate change. He's a lead author of the chapter on integrated risk and uncertainty assessment of climate change response policies for the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Professor Kudrick. Thank you, Michael. It's a real pleasure to be here this evening, and uh, we've heard a lot of interesting, diverse views with respect to how we deal with the flood insurance program. And uh, what I'd like to do is spend a few minutes to try to give you an idea in terms of how we might go forward. And one of the things that we have uh, definitely put on the table is risk-based rates are where we have to go, and I'll say a bit about that. But we also heard from Kevin, who indicated maybe the rates aren't as accurate as they should be, and that's a real challenge in terms of how to deal with that. So uh, the real uh, question I think that everyone is asking is, what role can insurance play as a part of a larger process? So let me say a little bit about some of the challenges and opportunities that insurance uh, can, can deal with this, a question like this. First of all, insurance can be a very efficient and effective way of uh, cushioning lo large losses. I think we all are aware of that. You just pay a small premium and you have an opportunity to get a large payment if you do suffer a loss. The other point that is often not recognized is that if insurance is priced in an appropriate way, it can encourage mitigation measures. It can encourage people to actually reduce their losses, and they would get a premium discount. If premiums are highly subsidized, that's not going to happen because there's no insurer who would want to give a premium discount if it turns out uh, you've already subsidized the rates. So the subsidization of rates really uh, discourage uh, that kind of incentive to go forward. And 
the, the challenge is people are reluctant to purchase insurance voluntarily uh, because they don't quite see it as a protective measure. They see it as an investment. They say, why should I actually spend my money on this? This is not going to happen to me. So here's the challenges that we face. Can we develop some long-term strategies for encouraging the adoption of mitigation and risk-reducing measures? What everyone has talked about here, we'd like to make communities safer. And obviously, that is a challenge that the Rockaways is facing and all the communities that were hit by Sandy in terms of how do you do a better job of dealing with that. But at the same time, to recognize that we don't do a good job in actually making decisions under, with respect to these low probability events. So it's that theme that I want to highlight with respect to how we might go forward. So here are some of the things we'll talk about. Uh, first of all, I want to talk about the notion of intuitive and deliberative thinking and how we make our decisions under uncertainty. Then talk about some guiding principles of insurance. What is a strategy for implementing a Flood Insurance Reform Act of 2012, which I will argue, and a number of us have, and people here at the table have said, this is a revolutionary piece of legislation. It has its problems, and clearly I think it's important that Kevin highlighted some of the challenges, but it is revolutionary in the sense that it is pushing forward the notion of risk-based rates. No other piece of legislation has ever passed Congress in the property side that has ever done anything like that. In general, one stays away from that. But there are challenges to implement that, and the challenges are the affordability challenges, the fact that people really essentially aren't necessarily in a position to even pay for some of the high insurance premiums that will go up, and the question is how do we deal with that? And then I'll talk a little bit about uh, a case study that we have done. This is work that is being done uh, with my colleagues at Wharton, uh, uh, Jeff Joukowsky, Erwin Michel Kajan, and Carolyn Kuski at Resources for the Future, and we're all, a whole group of us are trying to figure out the best way to deal with it. So let me quickly go through what I would recommend as a, a book that if some of you may have read, uh, but if you haven't, I think you will find it quite fascinating, Thinking Fast and Slow by Daniel Kahneman, a psychologist who won the Nobel Prize in economics because of the fact that he's had such an enormous influence on uh, thinking in this area. And the basic idea, and I'll go through it fairly quickly just to make sure that we, we get with, have time for questions, et cetera, from all of you, the idea is that there are two phases of thinking. There's there is intuitive thinking, system one behavior that has been discussed by psychologists over the years, which basically says we make decisions very quickly, we deal with our emotions, we have simple de decision rules to deal with the problems, and it works extremely well for most situations. It doesn't do well at all with low probability, high consequence events where we don't have experience, where we don't really know how to deal with it. That's the challenge, and that's one of the reasons why we should recognize we have these biases. How are we going to deal with them? Well, the other part, the system two part of our brain, the system two aspect is deliberative thinking. We use systematic models. We make trade-offs. We do cost-benefit analysis. We do all the things that a number of us teach about, but recognize we have a hard time practicing, our, myself included, in terms terms of a lot of these decisions, and so the challenge is how do we bring them together? Let me just say a little bit about some of the biases that have led to the problems that we're facing today in the flood area. There, and this is all part of system one behavior. The availability bias. We estimate the likelihood of a disaster by the salience. And if it hasn't happened, we don't think it's going to happen. Afterwards, we say, we better do something about this. We better take, uh, take steps. Uh, but we don't even at that point have a very clear notion of what we should do as a result of that. The other parts are the ones that discourage us from doing it. We have threshold models. We say the probability is so low, it's not going to happen to me, it's below my threshold level of concern. We have imperfect information with respect to sort of misperceiving the risk, and that sort of feeds right on to the threshold model. And most important, and the, pr the challenges that we face, it's myopia, our short-term horizons. We don't think about the notion of how do we begin to make long-term decisions. We don't make our decisions on the basis of what might happen over a period of time. Uh, and as a result, we may actually decide we're not going to mitigate. I'm not sure what that uh, short-term horizon was above, but I think we're safe, right, Michael? <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> uh, and, and as a result of our myopia, we say, why should I invest in a mitigation measure? 
uh, I want to make sure I have to pay a certain amount of money for this, and I want to make sure that I get something back in two or three years, even though the measure might last for the length of your, ha uh, the, uh, of your house, uh, like the life of your house. So that, those are some of the challenges that we face on the system one behavior. So our question that we've been raising is, how do we overcome the barriers to a flood risk, encourage long-term thinking, that's the, the goal, but if we're going to deal with our intuitive uh, system one part of ourselves, we've got to have short-term uh, incentives. And so the basic notion is, can we have some kind of insurance? And we would push the notion that you should require insurance. It often is required as a condition for a mortgage. But in general, require insurance and well-enforced standards to develop these strategies, but give the financial incentives so people will feel that they can address the, this problem of myopia. And so that's the second part of it. So here's the basic notion that we have been thinking about, about in, in with respect to insurance. The, the, the policy that everyone is recommending, and we would certainly support, that premiums have to reflect risks. Now, there are two very good reasons it has to do that. One is that it tells you how hazardous a place is. If it turns out you have a very low premium, you think you're safe. So you're given all the incorrect information when you're subsidized. And so having a premium that reflects risk does that, but it also encourages the mitigation measures because you can uh, get a premium discount, which you otherwise wouldn't get. But the other principle, and it's the one that all of us are sensitive to, and we have to be, is dealing with equity and affordability. Because if we can't deal with that, we're going to, first of all, politically, it's a non-starter. We all understand that has to be on the table, and it should be on the table on the basis of fairness. And so we would suggest that instead of dealing with premiums to address that issue, deal with something that several people have already talked about, vouchers. Have some notion of, of something that is outside of the uh, insurance premium. Still let everyone know what the premium is. Give them a voucher that requires a special treatment. And there are lots of programs that do that today. The food stamp program is the classic one we're, uh, we're all aware of. HUD has, ha has uh, choice vouchers that would fit in very well with these, these basic ideas, and there are others as well. So in some sense, we have the mechanisms to do it. Now, here's where I think Bigot Waters comes into play. Bigot Waters, as we can see, has risk-based premiums. We've heard about that. Not for all homes, but certainly for second homes and for ones that have repetitive flooding. And then there's a, a challenges, as we've heard from... Uh, from uh, Josh and from uh, uh, Steve, uh, the, the basic notions of grandfathering and the subsidization and the, and the challenges that that plays. But if we somehow recognize that we can have some kind of uh, 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 an affordability issue on the table, and I should say, Kevin, that that funny study has been funded. Uh, it will start in January, so it's going to happen. It's long delayed FEMA uh, ha for the National Academy of Sciences. There will be a study on affordability that will begin in January, and the hope is that it will be somehow addressing the, the basic issues that we're talking about. How do we deal with this issue from the vantage point of going forward? Here are a few thoughts on that. How do we encourage the, uh, the, the people to invest in loss reduction measures? Risk-based premiums to start with. Long-term loans, and that is really important, and it's been mentioned by uh, several of our panelists as one way to deal with it. Long-term loans, so you spread the cost of a flood-proofing measure or an elevation uh, thing so that people aren't paying up front the very, very high cost that would discourage them from actually doing this. And if you have a long-term loan and you have an insurance premium reduction, this could be a win-win situation because at that point, the individual will say, the cost of my loan will be less than my insurance premium, uh, that the reduction I'm going to get, so I'm going to want to do that. So that, those are the three elements with respect to sort of dealing with the loss reduction measure. With respect to the affordability issues, uh, the means-tested vouchers that we are, would push for, insurance premium, uh, 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 home improvement loans, and here's the, the part that we don't know how this will play out, but it's a carrot and stick notion. If you want to need special treatment, if you have affordability issues or if there's a grandfathering problem or there's some elements in terms of feeling that it's unfair that these premiums have gone way up, well, a voucher might be most appropriate, but then you have to mitigate. So it's a carrot and stick idea. If it turns out that you get a voucher, the idea is make your house safer and put the two together. 
And as a result of that, you should be able to save money yourself as a a homeowner, but at the same time, you would uh, save the government money. And so the hope is to get some congressional support around this issue to preserve brigand waters, which we think is very, very important, and also to require flood insurance and have the loans and tie it to the property, not the individual, for all the reasons we were talking about on terms of System 1 behavior. What I want to do in the last few minutes is just to give you a very quick idea of how we have looked at this problem in uh, Ocean County, New Jersey, where we actually got a lot of data with respect to what uh, could happen. This is a study with Carolyn Kuski. And what we were trying to do is to see how a program like this might work in the context of how much people would have to pay for these policies, uh, for this kind of, a, of, of a, uh, an insurance program and a loan, if it turns out you had this system in place. So we have two families that we've looked at, and these are re- reasonably realistic pieces of data that we got from the flood program. We have a family number one uh, in an A zone, which is a less hazardous zone, and they pay $4,000 for flood insurance. Uh, now, with the new maps, hopefully accurate maps, that's a challenge, we recognize that. Uh, but if you had accurate maps, uh, this is what they would be paying, if, uh, at least in terms of this example. So it's always easy to construct an example, uh, we, uh, but in some sense, this is, this is approximately what the rate would be. Family 2 is in a V zone, which is a more ha- high hazardous zone. They pay a very large amount for insurance, 18550 and they may not have paid that amount beforehand, which is, of course, what a lot of these concerns. We're going to say both homes are three feet below the fl- uh, base flood elevation, and each family has a family income of $50,000, so they're at the level where there would be some sort of support that would have to be given in order to be able to somehow have them afford this kind of uh, flood insurance and a loan. So, the, uh, so family one um, uh, has... Um, uh, gets uh, $25,000 uh, uh, loan in order to be able to so, uh, sort of uh, to elevate their home, and family two gets 55000 And a means-tested voucher would be any cost above 2500 which is 5% of 50000 So it's an example just to highlight how these things would play out. Here's the basic uh, set of results, at least, that would come out for these two families. If you had just a voucher, a, a, a means-tested voucher for the insurance premium alone, you can see how much the federal government would pay as well as how much these individuals would pay under these different circumstances. The second set of columns show basically what would be paid if you actually require the person to mitigate and you give them basically a voucher to help them along. And the, be- the message is a very clear one. They will be paying considerably less than they otherwise would, uh, and the, ver- the government saves an enormous amount of money, and after the loan is paid off, there is absolutely no uh, obligation on the part of the government. So the basic idea that we would suggest is, let's begin to recognize that if we can put mitigation and insurance together, we have an opportunity to actually reduce these losses, but make them affordable. And if we can't do these two things together, then I think we really haven't achieved what we would like to see in the context of this program. The final um, sort of uh, slide with respect to this is here's what the costs are uh, for with respect to the federal government cost or the cost of the vouchers. You can see with an insurance voucher alone, the federal government will pay an eno- much more than they would be paying with the, with, the lo- with the mitigation loan and insurance for the first 20 years. And it goes, wh- it goes even further down uh, with respect to uh, after year 20. So the idea is, can you bring a set of divergent groups together? Can everyone recognize that, uh, and you can think about the conservative Republicans saying, we want to make sure that we're dealing with something that is risk-based. You can see the notion of on the, on the liberal side of saying, we really want to make sure we encourage and deal with affordability. Is there a way of pulling them together? And our thought was, at least a carrot and stick gives one an opportunity to kind of do that and, and do it in, in a way that would save everyone money and encourage the kind of mitigation with the notion that we have accurate data. I don't want to in any way uh, uh, deny the fact that this is a challenge. So here are some of the long-term issues that, one, uh, that uh, we have to deal with, and they've been brought up in the earlier conversations by all of our panelists. Uh, how long will it take FEMA to develop new maps that more accurately uh, assess the risks of flooding in a, true, in a timely fashion that reflect the challenge? 
change, uh, that reflect climate change uh, challenges. So we have a climate change problem, obviously, on top of that. What are the challenges in implementing the means-tested vouchers? And I know Serge was mentioning, and uh, the idea of doing affordability studies and getting involved in that is going to be an important component for New York City in addressing that. And finally, how costly will the program be to the federal government, which is what everyone is asking in terms of our situation today, uh, and uh, in, if we started looking about flood-prone areas throughout the United States. Our immediate challenges, how can we present, uh, uh, how, how can we preserve the best features of big orders? Uh, and that, of course, is one that is on the table right now with all of this legislation. As Michael uh, appropriately mentioned at the beginning, it's there. Uh, we don't know whether or not uh, we're going to see bigger waters preserved or whether something will take its place. Our feeling is that for the same reasons that others have mentioned, the notion of delaying is not the way to go. Let's try to figure out a way to deal with the affordability issue and preserve the legislation. Final uh, slide here uh, is one that uh, it would na uh, naturally happen if it turns out people decide not to mitigate. Uh, and you can read this and said, Jerry, uh, he, uh, Jerry looked into flood insurance but says it's too damned expensive. This was his solution to the problem. Uh, it's probably not the way one necessarily wants to go. Uh, but at least it is at least something we have to reckon with when people don't take uh, steps. And uh, a couple of studies, just to mention the study that on the National Academy on Disaster Resilience that highlights a lot of the challenges. And as Michael mentioned, we are, we've done some work on insurance and behavioral economics. The subtitle of our book is Improving Decisions in the Most Misunderstood Industry. And we don't know quite how to do that, but we'll try. Thanks very much. Thank you very much. We have about 15 minutes for questions. Right in front here. And uh, there are buttons on your chair, so that uh, on your seats. Uh, I thought uh, Professor Kuhnreuter's um, ideas were really great uh, for the vouchers and, and mitigation incentives and all that. Um, so best case, but that sounds like it would be long and convoluted and complicated to uh, make happen. So best case scenario, um, uh, if everything went, if everything went well and, uh, that eventually, uh, happened, how long would that take? <laughs> and what, what would need to happen for that to be enacted? I think, I think the biggest challenge we face right now is the one that everyone has brought up with respect to how do we begin to develop appropriate means-tested vouchers, what's the affordability way that we're going to address that issue. If we could get that in place with a system in place building on other programs like the HUD program, then I think it's a real a question with respect to tying that together with the maps, which I think is something everyone wants to make sure that at least they have some notion of, uh, of maps that are accurate. And then uh, it's really, like all of these programs, it's always a matter of time how long it will take. But I think the, the question that is on everyone's plate right now is to get that affordability at a, at a level where we can operationalize that. So would that take one year, ten years? <laughs> well, I, I would say more than one year and hopefully less than ten. How's that for a range? <laughs> Hi. So with flood insurance, which is something that the homeowner, that's the brunt, that's what the homeowner has to pay. Everyone's discussing mitigation, but what no one up there talk, talked about was how much of the mitigation is actually through infrastructure issues and infrastructure problem, uh, projects that would actually protect the coast even more. I'll use Rockaway as an example. The boardwalk, which was destroyed during Hurricane Sandy, portions of it that were um, damage from Irene still hadn't been fixed a year after, and the city did virtually nothing after Hurricane Irene, which was a year before Sandy, to protect the coast and build up resiliency. And the rebuilt boardwalk, they can't even give a timeline as to when that will be built. So insurance is very personal to homeowners, but so much of what can be done to protect a home and a homeowner is infrastructure problems and, in, and infrastructure projects that are funded through FEMA, through the na national gov through the federal government down to city projects that seem to be taking longer and longer. So I think it's sort of like a two different issue. You know, when you're saying, oh, well, you'll get a voucher if you mitigate your home, well, how? You know, I mean, some of these homes are over 100 years old. It's hard to lift them, and that's really the only option when 
there are opportunities to protect a home and protect homeowners by creating stronger infrastructure around. But again, that has nothing to do with the homeowner. So it's sort of a, a hard thing to say, well, if you, if you use mitigation to protect your home when so much is out of our hands as a homeowner. So I mean, either for Sergey to talk about the city's plan and I mean, a year went by after Irene and nothing was done. Well, all I'd add is, I mean, there's $50 billion that were appropriated after Sandy. Um, and as uh, uh, Kevin alluded to, I mean, they are in the process of building a new berm, a new dune, which is 100% federally paid for under Sandy. They removed the local cost sharing, which is something we were very much opposed to. But nevertheless, that is the case. And so there is the federal investment there. The other thing I would argue, though, is, and I'll just say, is that berms and, and beach renourishment projects don't eradicate the risk. There is still a residual risk of a disaster coming and hitting, hitting these properties. And certainly in the case of Sandy, it is not a worst-case scenario. And so to some extent, you have to look at, are we encouraging development in harm's way and, and balancing that? But I understand your point that, obviously, it needs to be done in the collective. And one of the things that Josh mentioned, I believe anyway, is that under the flood insurance program, one of the things that a community, when they opt into the flood insurance program, because the community has to join it, if you want to buy flood insurance, the community has to participate, is the community rating system. And the community rating system is basically saying if you do certain things, if you do certain things with your zoning, if you do certain investments, you could actually reduce the overall risk, which then benefits other people's uh, uh, flood insurance uh, policies. And we've seen in places in the country, whether it's in Iowa or in Florida, where communities have actually overall reduced their flood insurance because they've made investments in community mitigation, which benefits every single home. Now, I would say if uh, <clears throat> I would point you to our <clears throat> special initiative report uh, released in June, and I think there's a very judicious and, and, and robust, uh, you know, $3.7 billion coastal plan. If you look at, uh, I think, a, a well-balanced mix of gray and green infrastructure uh, citywide on, on the coastline, uh, that's in addition to you know, building code measures, uh, a billion-dollar utility uh, resilience plan that, that we've been uh, all working on together. So I think uh, we have been, uh, I think, judiciously looking at the most cost-effective way uh, to spend taxpayer and ratepayer uh, money uh, across all classes of infrastructure. I just want to amplify on what uh, uh, Steve and Sergey said. I think that, uh, and certainly I, the presentation that I made focused entirely on the mitigation of the individuals, but I think you need a whole set of tools, and they've highlighted that. Uh, communities can work together on that. Uh, Governor Cuomo has a tool, as, as you know, an uh, opportunity in Staten Island for people to actually move away and get something back, and that has been actually quite successful in a couple of communities. So I think you need a... I said something. Uh, you, 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 need, you need to really look at the whole spectrum, and I think each of us were focusing on some elements, particularly with bigger waters, but it's very important that you brought up that point. Hi. Uh, I'm wondering if someone up there in the panel, I don't particularly care who it is, could throw some light on uh, the negotiation process that was alluded to by many speakers that uh, takes place before a community accepts rather than has foisted upon them a flood map. I'm, I'm interested in just what this negotiation process negotiates. I'm going to uh, press gang uh, Leah uh, Cohen, if you guys don't mind, because she's been uh, on the front lines on this. Uh, Leah. Sure. So um, so I, I wouldn't say it's exactly a negotiation. There's a regulatory process. Um, we actually tomorrow are going to be, FEMA is going to be releasing the preliminary flood insurance rate maps, um, which is kind of the first step in the regulatory process. And uh, once those maps go public, there's a, a public comment period where people can make comments on inaccuracies in the map, you know, things that are mislabeled, et cetera. Um, and then after that, sometime in the spring, uh, we expect to have a public appeals period. And at that point in time, um, you know, FEMA's got very specific regulatory guidelines about what you can and can't appeal. Um, and uh, more or less, you have to submit, you have to do some analysis and submit data showing that FEMA's approach based on their own guidelines is wrong. Um, and so, you know, this is, this is kind of the process that we're going to be following uh, with FEMA over the next year and a half. Uh, once all the appeals are collected and, and come in to the city, FEMA will go through a process of dealing with them, deciding which ones uh, 
you know, merit attention and which ones they're going to disregard. And then at that point in time, they issue what's called um, a letter of final determination. And then we as a community have six months to adopt the maps. Otherwise, um, if we don't do that, then we are no longer eligible for the National Flood Insurance Program. So it's, you know, it, it, it's a regulatory process. It, it's a pretty strict regulatory process. I think um, what's been unique so far is that um, because we had such out-of-date maps, because we'd been pushing FEMA for quite some time uh, to update the maps and give us better information about our risks, we had a whole cooperating technical partnership agreement in place. And so we actually had technical expertise within the city that was kind of working with FEMA to understand um, all of the complicated details around the maps. Um, this is just a more fundamental question. Should flood insurance be addressed at the state level, given that insurance is already addressed at the state level? And given, and given how dysfunctional Congress is, I don't think we want anyone in the, uh, a legislator in Wisconsin making decisions for us. So from the perspective of my organization, my view, it really doesn't matter if it's a state government, a federal government, a private insurer, the issue is about having the right rate structure. I will say the state of Florida has decided to run its own flood insurance program. It's called Citizens Property Casualty Insurance Program. That program has gone significantly in debt. They don't have the capital to cover their losses um, and, and, frankly, has the same problems that we've talked about the NFIP and, and worse. Just to elaborate a little bit on Josh's comment, I mean, well, Citizens is, yeah, it's become the, it's actually a homeowner's insurance, actually. It's become the insurer of first resort for the regular homeowners, not even flood that's done by the federal government. But, you know, the whole idea of risk is you want to pool the risk. And so if you concentrate the risk into one particular state, you're actually concentrating potentially your losses in any one particular event. And that's part of the problem with the flood insurance program and the, as a whole is that you have this, the only people who are going to buy flood insurance are the people who are most likely to use it. And so you're not able to distribute that risk over a wider uh, body of, of, of insurance. Right now, if you, when you buy nationwide, state farm, whatever, for your homeowner's insurance, they then go out and they purchase reinsurance, which is an international marketplace. I mean, there are companies that are, they're selling insurance in Germany, they're selling in Japan, they're doing whatever. And so these, these insurance companies are laying off the risk on these international markets. There's even catastrophe bonds where people are just investing in risk. Um, and what we've seen is after each natural disaster, because there's still a lot of property casualty loss in, in, in any natural disaster, not just flood, um, the market grows, actually. So after Hurricane Andrew, 92, the North insurance market grew. After 94, Northridge earthquake market grew. After uh, 2005 storms, the market grew. And so the, to me, the concern of doing it at a state level would be that you're really concentrating the risk and actually not distributing it where you're not going to have every part of the country flooding at the same time. Wisconsin, the Mississippi River in Wisconsin is not going to flood necessarily in the same year that you have an event like Sandy. But I think your question is a good one because it uh, raised another issue. And that is um, an a flood map, uh, an a flood policy is the same anywhere. So um, one size fits all is yet another problem with the program. That um, if you're in the uh, some river valley that floods all the time, you'll be paying the same as somebody who's never had even a flood ever, but they happen to be in an a, a zone. So it's one size fits all, and that's you know I understand Steve's point. You want a bigger pool, but it does cause problems such as that. And then just, and I'll be really brief, but that, and that also speaks to, to me, it's part of the problem of running it as a federal pro, as a government program that doesn't have the underwriting that you have in the private sector and how they underwrite on homeowners. Thank you for taking my question. Um, my name is Andrea Pesoris, and I'm a locally based financial sector analyst. So the macroeconomic issues affect the banking sector, and these are. Uh, but I also serve on the Sustainable Investing Committee at the New York Society of Security Analysts, and, and the environmental issues also come across my attention. Um, I have two questions. Could you clarify that you mentioned that um, there, and I'll quote you, I, I don't think I'm wrong in what I uh, took down. It said that there were more synthetic um, than actual storms that happened here in the Atlantic. Um, and then my question, because I'm curious about if no, that's, that's not what, what I said. said. Oh, okay. So what did Please you don't say? Me on. <laughs> okay, so what, what did you say? No, so, um, so the way uh, FEMA does its flood maps, it looks at 
uh, previous history of storms. And uh, so we have more storms <clears throat> by virtue of the fact that it's no longer 1983. It's, you know, oh, so they're paying more. So it's, just, it's, it's a, it's a, lo a, lo a larger data set uh, of storms. Got it. Okay, my next issue is that when you have a calamity, um, and um, I can't really use something like 9-11, I can't really, perhaps, you know, you could use a Katrina or you could use a, an Irene, um, but where you have uh, something that affects the environment to the degree that employment, and these are middle class people, we're not looking at wealthy people, so the, are they going to be able to um, pay the premiums? The presumption is that they're going to be able to pay, that they remain employed and that their employment is not negatively impacted impacted by calamity. And I'm saying that that's not at all the case. And I said the risk also is, is that FEMA is a capricious government organization and has failed um, to really be responsible with regard to um, its, its, I would argue, un, I would look at unfair government. So the issues of unfair government and the risk of that these people will not be employed and then um, the damage will come into things like um, where eminent domain can then take the property of these people. And so my question is, is in, like I said, as in um, um, some, somebody understanding the macroeconomic environment, are these, what's going to happen when their employment is impacted and they may not be able to pay on the, the mortgage, uh, or not the mortgage, the, yeah, everything, you know, flood, mortgage, you name it. And then the property, grand scale, comes into the eminent domain um, arguability issue. I was just talking about it from a bigger, because you're right, it's not just flood insurance. I mean, it's homeowner's insurance. It's their mortgage. It's all of that stuff. They're paying a mortgage. They're paying homeowner's insurance on a home that isn't necessarily there, and they don't have an income. And so, uh, you know, it, it, this is a real challenge, and that's from a macro disaster response, and flood insurance is a piece of that. But in reality, is some of it is, is about reorienting our federal programs and trying to, to create this, you know. And so even a, getting a, a three-month hiatus on your homeowners, uh, on your mortgage, but then having all that whole three month come to do in that month four is, is, is a problem. And some of that is supposed to be dealt with not just through FEMA, but through HUD, through the Community Development Block Grant Program, got $16 billion in the Sandy Supplemental, and so other me mechanisms. But you're raising bigger issues that are much bigger than just the flood insurance program. We are out of time. I want to thank all of our panelists for terrific presentations. I want to thank you for being a great audience. Thanks a lot. <laughs>